What's up, fight fans? Welcome to Fight Nerds episode number 12. My name is Flying Brian J, and tonight my co host is once again the viewers that are watching or listening live on MMA Mania's Facebook page. So, thank you guys all so very much for joining me. Throughout the course of the show, you're going to have to correct me when I say something wrong or give your opinion on the fights that we are about to predict. So, this podcast is going to happen in three parts. First, I'm going to talk about UFC Fight Night 112 and my predictions for each fight, starting at the top with Michael Maverick Chiesa versus Kevin the Motown Phenom Lee, all the way down to the first fight of the night, which is Tony the Eagle Martin versus Johnny Hollywood Case. Part number two, we're going to talk about some fight news. Uh, Jermaine Durand me stripped of her title. Now Cyborg is going to fight Megan Anderson for the now vacant shouldn't have ever been happened before this uh, UFC Women's Featherweight Championship. Also, Conor McGregor versus Floyd Money Mayweather. We're going to talk about that in section number two. Section number three is uh, what I like to call geeked out, where I'm just going to tell you about some things that I've been excited about outside of mixed martial arts in the past seven days. So if you're watching right now live on Facebook and you don't want to watch the whole thing, but you're still interested in the show, you can subscribe to MMA Mania on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Addict, uh, Voodoo, uh, everywhere. If you if you want to get a podcast somewhere, tell me and I'll make sure that it is there and you can subscribe to MMA Mania there. So, I'm a little bit late. I like to do the show at 8, 8, at 8 p.m. on Mondays, but I was struggling to tag my own Facebook page. So, I'd like to ask you guys to like my Facebook page. Evidently, that's not going to happen tonight. So, anyway, let's start talking about the fights. Happening on Sunday, the uh, 25th of June, beginning at 5.30 p.m. Eastern on Fight Pass. And the main card starts at 9 p.m. Eastern on Fox Sports 1 with a six-fight main card. So, of course, below me here, I want you guys to vote for who you think is going to win the main event. Michael Chiesa, Kevin Lee. If you're here on Facebook right now, you can see that I'm donning a shirt to throw a little ode to uh, Kevin Lee acting like Russell Westbrook or acting like Conor McGregor, whatever. Anyway, the odds are only out for the main event and the co-main event. Let me try to pull them up quickly. I believe that Kevin Lee is minus 120, and the comeback on Michael the Maverick Chiesa is at even odds. Oh my goodness gracious. Kevin Lee is minus 135, and the comeback on Chiesa is plus 115. <clears throat> that is kind of crazy. Now, of course, Chiesa hasn't fought since April of 2016 uh, when he defeated Benyel Dariush via rear naked choke in the second round. He was scheduled to fight Tony Ferguson back in June of 2016, uh, but he pulled out with a back injury. So right away, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about some somewhat intangibles in this matchup. And that is, one, at the summer kickoff press conference, Kevin Lee... Really, all he said was, I know that Michael's mom has tickets to the show, and Michael blew up on it. I, I question Mike's mental fortitude, his mental state. Maybe Kevin is really under his skin. They haven't been talking trash since then, though, so maybe not. So I question Michael Kiesa's mental fortitude. Then I question, is he going to have ring rust for sitting out more than a year? How is he going to be coming off of a back injury? And then the third intangible is he trains with <clears throat> one of the top two Worst mixed martial arts coaches, you know, in mixed martial arts. There's one, Edmund Tarverdian, and two, Rick Little from Sick Jitsu, uh, from Sick Jitsu in Washington. Uh, or S Seattle? Or, where the hell is Sick Jitsu? Gosh darn it, I'm forgetting all of a sudden. Spokane Valley, Washington, right. Rick Little is an idiot. Rick Little doesn't believe in altitude affecting his fighters he had a fighter not too long ago Spitz who was losing really bad to Godbeer and in between round two and three Godbeer asked for a stool and Rick Little told him that he didn't need a stool because he's about to knock Godbeer out well duh, gosh no no duh so I'm gonna knock him out that's why I don't need a stool great coaching Rick Little he also says that he doesn't like his fighters to block body shots during practice because if you're getting dropped by a body shot, you're a pussy, he says. Uh, he also doesn't like his fighters to check leg kicks. What the fuck, man? Uh, so those three things are, are keeping me a little bit from picking Michael Chiesa. But 
Excuse me, I got a little frog. This happens every time. Kevin Lee, he's a pretty damn good wrestler. He was a national championship tournament qualifier at Division II school in New York, I believe. Uh, but he quit after either his freshman or sophomore year. He dropped out of college to pursue to pursue mixed martial arts, and he's pretty good with his wrestling. He's a very physically strong man. Uh, his body, you know, he obviously looks good on the scale. He shows up looking like a million bucks. But he doesn't set up any of his strikes or any of his takedowns. The head kick that he wobbled Trinaldo with in his last fight, Masaranduba, Francisco Trinaldo, he threw that same kick like seven times before it landed. And he just threw it naked every time. The thing was, Masaranduba was standing in front of him with his hands down and wasn't really respecting the kick. He was just uh, banking on getting his hand to his ear to block that kick in time. And Kevin just threw it over and over. And then he finally threw it off of a Masaranduba jab and he caught him he also doesn't set up his takedowns he will just nakedly blindly shoot from super far away i don't like that about him and also i think that kiesa in scrambles i think he's going to be faster i think he's slicker with his with his back takes with his opportunistic grappling uh michael he's really good at getting double underhooks when somebody shoots at him from too far away he's good at getting double underhooks and if he gets that and still starts to lose his balance and starts to get his butt toward the canvas like he's going to get taken down he will quickly switch to a wizard so that he can hip down and use that wizard to get right back to his feet even though he's taken down i love that defensive wrestling from kiesa and then thinking about well i want to talk about kiesa has also fought trinaldo but kiesa dominated trinaldo where lee got hurt against trinaldo and was losing up until he rocked trinaldo and was able to sink in that rear naked choke uh I want to talk the process, where Chiesa used the process better. He, he beat, it wasn't as convincing how he beat Trinaldo, but the way he got to the victory was more dominating than how Kevin Lee beat Trinaldo. And no, uh, MMA math doesn't work, but just follow me here. These guys together only have one knockout victory in their entire career, and that was <clears throat> Kevin Lee, I forget how long ago it was, Kiesa's never knocked anybody out. Kiesa has, I need to look at it. Um, together they have 17 submissions, 14 decisions, and this fight will most likely end in submission. So who do you think it is going to be? Kevin Lee submitting Michael Kiesa or Michael Kiesa submitting Kevin Lee? I have to believe that Michael Kiesa is going to submit Kevin Lee. Like I said, he just shoots from too far away. Um, he might come in there too confident because he rattled Mike at the press conference. Maybe that was a little bit of reverse psychology Mike was playing. But I think that that uh, this fight is going to happen in the grappling realm, not mostly on the feet. And I think that Michael dominates Kevin there. A lot of Kevin's victories, kind of like Donald Cerrone, he will rock his opponent, get it to the ground, and then submit it there, like Donald does, you know, the head kick like he did with Trinaldo. He'll hurt him with his striking. His striking is improving. He does hit pretty damn hard. Then he finishes the fight with his grappling. But I just think that the majority of the fight is going to happen in Kiesa's realm. Kiesa's never been knocked out. Uh, Kiesa, he got submitted by Jorge Masvidal, but that's really his only legitimate defeat. His only other defeat is to, uh, damn it, I'm blanking. Joe Lozon, and it was a doctor stoppage, and Mike was super annoyed by that, but like I keep saying, I'm reiterating, I'm being redundant, the fight's going to happen on the mat, and that's where Mike's the best. I think he's better than Kevin there, and I'm picking Michael Chiesa by third round submission, so book that on your UFC Pick'em, and if you're not in the MMA Mania's UFC Pick'em League, pre please do that right away. Jeremy Floyd says, I'm going to go crazy and say Lee is going to win by submission. Lee is looking for an exciting KO. That's why he's playing mind games with him, and, and it's working. Perhaps Lee is not going to take him down. Lee going to get him. That's uh, Nathaniel Rockwell says that. Staniel Hunt, Stanley Honeycutt says blocking body shots in trading teaches a fighter different methods of blocking body shots. I guess this idiot coach doesn't want him to block headshots in training. What's wrong with some of these coaches? I, I don't know. The guy, it's just everything. So Rick Little is just everything. He doesn't believe that altitude affects fighters. He doesn't want his fighters to use a stool in between rounds when he, when the fighter asked him to. And in Michael's fight against Benil Daryush, even though Mike won in fantastic, impressive fashion, he was getting leg kicked to oblivion. 
not to oblivion, but he was eating a lot of leg kicks and he wasn't checking them. And in between round one and two, Rick Little told Kiesa, hey, buddy, you need to move so he can't leg kick you. Oh, no shit. No shit? How about you give him some actual concrete reasoning or advice, bro? Hey, don't get hit by leg kicks. Good luck. That's just, that's some bullshit. Anyway, I'm picking Kiesa via third round submission. If you want to play UFC Pick'em with us, search for MMA Mania's UFC Pick'em League, and uh, that would be great. Let's move on to the second fight of the night, or the co-main event. Nathan Rockwell says the fireworks are going to be early in that one. He is right there. That one's going to be a banger. It's going to be a super exciting fight. It's a fun main event. Uh, and whoever wins, it's it's going to be exciting. And I think whoever wins, it's going to be decisive. We're not going to have a split decision. Kevin Lee could definitely submit Kiesa. It's not impossible. Ke- Lee could knock out Kiesa. That's not impossible either. But I, I have to be solid in my picks. Otherwise, it's not believable. Going with Kiesa. Moving down. Tim, the Barbarian, Bosch versus Johnny Big Rig Hendricks. This is the only other fight with odds out. I was hoping, I was hoping the odds would drop soon so I could uh, go over the rest of the card. But I've done my research, and here we go. Hendricks is minus 210. The comeback on the Barbarian. Bosch is plus 175. What interests me here is that, of course, you know, Hendricks moved up to 100, 185 pounds. He's the former welterweight champion, 170 pounds. He moved up and he fought Hector Lombard, who Hector is also a guy who used to fight at 170 and had trouble making the weight. So really what we had was a couple of big welterweights fighting in the middleweight division. Now, the Barbarian, this dude is a big middleweight. This He's a big effing dude. He's going to be three inches taller than Big Rig. Uh, he's got a five-inch reach advantage. And I just think he's... Johnny looks thin lately, right? He looked he looked a little more filled out in his fight against Hector Lombard, but Bosch is a huge man. Hendricks, you know, he's a two-time Division I All-American wrestler for Oklahoma State, so he has this wrestling to fall back on. Bosch, I don't know if he's going to be able to take down Bosch. I mean, he couldn't take down Robbie Lawler. Lawler has good takedown defense, but Bosch could just throw his dad bod down on him and really squish him. Not only does Tim Bosch have a dad bod, but he has that dad strength. Uh, he has... 58% takedown defense. I don't know if Johnny's going to be able to get him to the ground. And, I, and uh, as Jeremy Floyd mentions, do you think Johnny has enough KO power for the middleweight? He thinks not, bro. I think not either, but I'm mentioning Johnny coming up to the middleweight division, and he looked like he was having a great time, a lot of fun against Hector Lombard. I should look it up to see how many strikes he landed in that fight. But it, but he just seemed to be flowing well. He was using a lot of diversity, switching from his uh, striking to a threatening with the level change for takedowns a lot. I think his output, Johnny Big Rig Hendricks, his output is going to win him this fight. Bosch is going to be looking for the KO strike, and Hendricks has one hell of a chin on him. Even when Wonderboy Thompson knocked him out, Johnny ate a bunch of strikes to the face before getting knocked out. A bunch of them. So he's got a pretty damn good chin. He ate some real good shots from Robbie Lawler, and of course, your chin goes down and down and down and down with every single strike you take, with every single fight you you have. But I think that Hendricks' chin and his output is going to get him a decision victory here. Also, just the threat of the level change. He likes to get in that single collar tie and hit his opponents with some uppercuts. The barbarian, the barbarian could go to back out of one of those, and Johnny hits him with a takedown. I just believe, and also, last thing, I. Tim Bosch is not a guy who I would ever have confidence in. I like his style. He's a fun guy to watch and all that jazz, but look at his record. He lost to uh, Jacare. I mean, th- there's no harm in that. Beat Rafael Natal, beat Josh Saman, rest in peace. Lost to Ed Herman, lost to Dan Henderson, lost to Talos Latis, beat Brad Tavares, lost to Luke Rockhold by an inverted uh, triangle in Kimura. It's just his record's real spotty. You can't count on him to get the victory. I am picking Hendricks via decision, but I don't like the odds for him. Minus 210. And Hendricks is somebody who, in 2017, you can't count on to really get a solid victory. So I wouldn't bet on Johnny Hendricks if you're a betting man, but I am picking him to win via decision. Moving down, Felice Lil Bulldog Herrig versus Justine Kish. There are no odds out for this fight. There's no odds out for the rest of the fight, so I'm kind of shooting blindly. If I'm way off, I apologize. I've, I forgot to mention it at the beginning. 
It's a good thing I'm not a dad, and it's a good thing that my father was busy all day yesterday because I used all of Father's Day, June 18th, to do film study. I woke up. I did film study pretty much all the, all my entire day. So here I am spitting it back at you guys. And again, I appreciate you for joining me. Justine is a kickboxer. She throws a lot of flashy techniques, likes a spinning back fist, which is fun. But in her UFC career, uh, she has been taken down rather easily. Let me look at her past opponents. I forget who... Ashley Yoder took her down a whole bunch, and I really think that Kiss should have lost that fight because she got taken down and, and controlled a lot. Sure, she landed more strikes, but I don't know. It's, it's do, you, do you score control versus strikes landed? It's a tough one. It was a very close fight. I would have scored it for Yoder, but nonetheless, Kish missed weight for that fight, so that's something we need to pay attention to here is can Kish make the weight? Felice, Lil Bulldog Herrick, in her last opponent against Alexa Grasso, she looked phenomenal. She looked like she, her body was in phenomenal shape, and, and uh, she won a clear decision. I, even though Grasso looked shocked when the judges read her, their verdict, it was one of, the, one of, if not the best performance that Felice Herrick has put on in, in the octagon. And what does she like to do? She likes to get takedowns. She likes to get uh, top control, a little bit of ground and pound. I think that Felice is more physically strong. And she has a clearer path to victory. Is Kish going to be able to negate Felice's takedown attempts and win purely on the feet? I don't think so. So I'm going with Felice Herrick via takedown, 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 and a little bit of control. If if the version of Felice that we saw last time shows up, I think she should easily be able to grind out Justine Kish. Stanley Honeycutt says, us Texans have some hard heads. I hope Johnny can get his game together if he can do it. If he can do it to Tim what he did to GSP, we have no problem talking about staying in the pocket and unloading on Tim. Right. Yeah, good point, Stanley. Yeah, I think Felice is going to win a 30-27, and if not, 29-28. Perhaps maybe she gets outpointed with strikes. She gets the top control takedowns, and we see another split decision, but I, I think that Felice Herrick pulls this one off. Oh, here's a moving down on the fight card. Joaquin Christensen, who was 14 and five versus, it's not as a Matt Mars, Mars or whatever. Uh, it's versus Dominic Reyes. Oh, this brings me to a point in the show where I want to say to you guys, if you guys like fighter interviews or you want to know some in-depth facts about fighters that maybe aren't that well known or anything like that. My friend of mine, James Lynch, does phenomenal, phenomenal fighter interviews. Uh, I think his website is just James Lynch. So search for James Lynch on YouTube. He has a playlist up right now. Let me see if – yeah, it's right there. So there's a playlist. James Lynch has all of his interviews for UFC Fight Night 112 up there, and I got a lot of my information from listening to his interviews with fighters, such as who we're about to talk about. Dominic Reyes, he's making his UFC debut – uh, he last fought on June 2nd where he won by head kick knockout in under a minute. And it's if you look at my Twitter, I tweeted this guy is making his UFC debut at UFC OKC. So just go to my Twitter, go to media, and it should be there. The guy, it was kind of like Betch Cohea against Holly Holm, you know, where she taunted Holly and then, bam, kicked her right in the face. Similar thing. Dominic Reyes versus uh, something Powell, Jordan Powell, I believe. Jordan gives him a little shake, like, nah, 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 buddy. And as he's doing that, whoop, bam, shin right to his jawbone and ear line, and he's knocked out cold. So he just fought on June 2nd, making his UFC debut here. And most of his victories are via first round KO or TKO head kick. Most of them. He has one, he has one victory that went to a decision, I believe. But so you look at his record, you look at that highlight right there, and you think that he's just a striker. No, this dude is an athlete. He played football in college at a local at a small town college in New York again I'm getting this information from his interview with James Lynch and he also wrestled in high school so he is an athlete through and through he could fall back on that wrestling ability if he has to once you learn that it's like riding a bicycle you just don't lose it and he's got to be training that every single day uh, and also that football background super athletic so I do think that he's his best place is going to be on the feet we've seen that he's a phenomenal lengthy striker and for his opponent, <clears throat> for his opponent Joachim Christensen, Christensen, I think is a little bit of a jobber. Sure, he has one UFC victory, but it's over a guy in Boyan, uh, 
Mihailovic, who is the jobberest jobber that was ever in the UFC. Just a poor sack of crap. I apologize. That's rude. He's He would whoop my ass, that's for sure. But as in terms of UFC level of competition, Bojan Mihailovic is poor. Really, really poor. Uh... Christensen is solid defensively. He does a good job of cutting off the cage rather than just following his opponents. He has decent timing with a, a right straight. And like Chiesa, um, he's really good with body lock takedowns. But I just don't think that he's really that good. And I think that Dominic Reyes is going to come in and show out. So a lot of people would be questioning uh, him coming into the UFC debut. I think he took the fight on just like 14 days notice or something like that. But since he just had a fight on June 2nd, uh, he never really got out of fight camp. That fight that he knocked the dude out lasted like a minute or whatever. So he's still in really good shape. I think that he's probably the better mixed martial artist than uh, Joachim Christensen. And I'm going to pick him via... Most of his wins are first round knockouts. I'm going to pick him via second round knockout. He's going to be, get tested a little bit because uh, Joachim, he's he's not really UFC level, but he's he's higher level than what Reyes has been facing in the past. So I think it's going to be a second round knockout for Dominic Reyes. Jeremy Floyd, gatekeeper is a better word, I guess. Yeah, I apologize for being rude to Bojan Mihailovic. Moving down. Tim the Dirty Bird Means versus Alex the Dominican Nightmare Garcia. And wow, did Garcia give Mike Pyle something to have nightmares about for years to come in his last fight. Pyle went for a low kick. Garcia caught him with an overhand right, sent him careening to the canvas. In incredible stuff from Garcia. Tim Means in his last fight against uh, Brazilian cowboy Alex Oliveira, I don't know. I don't know what the hell happened. I so that fight happened twice. Oliveira versus Means, and I got it wrong both times. The first time, I thought that Oliveira was going to be able to control Tim Means with the clinch and with his wrestling, with his smothering ability. Nope. Tim Means warded that off and kneed him in the face. So the second fight comes out, and it's like, well, Tim Means, well, obviously could handle that, the clinch of Oliveira, so he's going to win again. No, Oliveira dominated the shit out of him with the clinch. So. Basically, what that says to me is you don't know what version of Tim Means is going to show up. If he shows up in high form, I think he'll have a cardio advantage over Garcia. Garcia is a short dude. Uh, he's five inches shorter than Means. He's three, got three inches less in reach with his arms, four inches less in reach with his legs. He's very densely muscled, and he gasses rather quick. I mean, he has to really be careful, kind of like Tyron Woodley, to really conserve his energy and pick his shots really well because he throws full power, full body weight into every single shot that he throws and lands. Uh, so he has to be very careful with his gas tank. And Tim Means, phenomenal gas tank. He's the lengthier striker. And even if Garcia, he's got decent takedowns. When he gets in that clinch, Tim normally has fucking vicious elbows. Really, I'm backing Tim Means mostly because I think he'll have a cardio advantage, a distance advantage, um, and an overall striking advantage. So output, cardio, distance, all in favor of Tim Means. And if a decent version of him shows up, he could ward off the takedown attempts of Garcia. He might have a tough early early going, but as, as we pass the four-minute mark, I think Tim picks it up and either wins via decision or third-round KO or TKO. Keeping it trucking on down, BJ the Prodigy Pen versus Dennis Seaver. I don't. I honestly don't want to talk about this fight, guys. If you have some input, I would like to hear it from you guys in the comments. You you guys are my co-host tonight, so I would pass this one off to you. So, who are you picking in this fight? Uh, BJ Penn, sixteen and eleven, two draws. Dennis Seaver, twenty-two and eleven, with one no contest. Let's just go over some stats. BJ Penn, 55% takedown accuracy, 75% takedown defense. Seaver, 33% takedown accuracy, 65% takedown defense. Kyle Thompson asks, BJ is fighting again? With exclamation mark and a question mark and an exclamation mark and a question mark? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about, man. Why, bro? Jeez Louise, he took like three years off and then came in and just got molly whopped destroyed by Yair El Pantera Rodriguez. All right. Well, okay. I'll pull up my notes. I wrote some shit down about this fight. 
my first note was both dudes are old and should retire. Yeah. I mean, fuck. What's going on here? So for BJ Penn, people like to talk about how he's been training with Jackson Winklejohn. No, not even for Yair, not even against Yair was he training with Jackson Winklejohn. He was training a lot with uh, the MMA lab and with Bruce Leroy Caceres because he was trying to get ready for the length and the goofiness of Yair. Uh, for this fight, I looked at his Instagram. It looks like he's training with his original coach. I, I forget, you know, like one of his older coaches. I saw that he went out to Hawaii to work with him or maybe California. <clears throat> And uh, so who knows what version of BJ Penn is going to show up? Is it going to be the guy that's on his tippy toes against Frankie Edgar uh, not that long ago? Is it I, – I don't know. I don't know. Se- Seaver, he hasn't fought since 2015, and he was scheduled to fight BJ Penn last June at UFC 199 but pulled out due to injury. So right there, there's, there's a reason to pick BJ Penn. Seaver's coming off of a long injury layoff. But I really believe – Seaver is going to have a power advantage, an overall physicality advantage, and even though Seaver is rather washed up himself, 22 and 11, and won no contest, he probably has more MMA miles on him than BJ Penn. I'm with Aldo De Leon. He says Seaver will KO him with a spinning back kick. Yeah, Seaver should have a striking advantage, and let's see this mystical B- uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that BJ Penn has. Let's see it. I don't think we're going to see it, and I think Dennis Seaver lights him up with some spinning shit on the feet. I'm taking Dennis Seaver via second round KO or TKO. I know that everyone's a huge BJ Penn fan for some reason, and they're picking him to win because they love him. Um, I'm not. Dennis Seaver via second round KO or TKO. Moving down, the main event of the prelims that happened on Fox Sports 2, FS2, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. This fight will be happening around 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Clay the Carpenter Guida versus Eric Newbreed Coke. Uh, fun fact about this fight is back in the day when Anthony Pettis was this world beater, you know, it was after he had landed the Showtime kick, heard around the world. I believe it was when Showtime made his UFC debut, lost to Clay Guida. Clay Guida wrote the book on how to beat Anthony Pettis. Pressure, 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 right? That was at 155 pounds. Clay Guida uh, has since dropped to, he was at 145 pounds since he beat, uh, wait a second, let me pull this up. Since 2012, he's been at 145 pounds, and he's been doing damn well. He's been beating a lot of guys that, well, maybe not a lot of guys, but he dropped to featherweight in 2012, uh, 2013 against Hatsu Hiyoki. Uh, then he lost to Chad Mendez. Then he beat Tatsuya Kawajiri. Then he lost to Dennis Bermudez. Then he beat Robbie Peralta. Now he's lost to Tiago Tavares and Brian Ortega. So it's late career, it's late career division changing for Clay Guida. He is 32 and 14. The guy is um, 35 years old, fighting in these lower weight classes, that's pretty old, and that's a lot of miles to put on your body. Every time a fighter changes weight classes late in their career, like Rashad Evans, like Diego Sanchez, most of these dudes late in their career, it doesn't work out well for them. I don't think it's going to work out well for Clay Guida here. Eric Koch, the new breed, I feel like he really is the new breed. On the ground, Koch is really good there. And I think he could ward off the takedowns of Clay Guida. Or like Tavares did, Clay shot in for some, you know, he, he shoots in for millions of takedowns and just got guillotine choked. Perhaps, perhaps Coke could do that there as well. Against Shane Campbell in his last fight, Coke showed off that he's a pretty damn good striker as well. Good on the ground, good at the striking. I'm picking the younger guy, the fresher guy, uh, the guy that has a more well-rounded skill set, to be honest with you. One thing, again, and this is, a theme throughout this entire fight card. There are a whole bunch of dudes almost in every matchup that have sat out for more than a year. Coke has sat out since uh, May of 2016. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm picking Coke here probably via decision because Guida's really tough. Uh, He's real gritty. But I'm going to pick Coke via decision. Moving down... Uh, Randy Cantu says Guida should not fight. I thought he was retired. Yeah, man, he's one of these older guys. Uh, when did Clay fight last? He has lots of rust. Will affect Clay. Be- both guys, right, have sat out for a super long time. Let's look. 
Guida's last fight was against Brian Ortega at UFC 199. So both guys have over a year of layoff time. That's a lot of rust. Uh, and I think that rust will affect older fighters more than younger fighters. I'm picking, again, I'm picking Coke because he's more well-rounded. He's younger, he's fresher, uh, despite the layoff. Where, where both of them guys are having long layoffs, it should, should be even playing field, but Guida's super old, man. And also the late changing of divisions. But i got to negate myself a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm rambling and going back and forth. Man, if Guida had that level of cardio and that level of output, that level of forward pressure and just tenacity, determination at 145 pounds, can you imagine him not cutting those 10 extra pounds anymore and coming back to the lightweight division? Maybe that could be uh, really, really good, man. It's, this is a tough fight to pick. It really is. But again, pick and coke. Carla Esparza, the cookie monster, number eight. Straw weight in the world. She is 12 and 4 versus Marina, Iron Lady Morose, who is 8 and 1, and the number 10 woman straw weight in the UFC, and not necessarily in the world. Morose is 6 inches taller, and she has a 4 inch reach advantage. Uh, Carla Esparza, this is quite a fall from grace, and if she loses to Morose, that would be an, an incredible fall from grace. You go from being the champion, uh, Maybe she got her soul taken by Ioanni and Jacek. But then you go down and you lose to Marina Moroz. That would be a horrible look for you. Marina Moroz against Valerie Letourneau. She got taken down a lot. She was on her back and she was doing some stupid shit with her jiu-jitsu. Just going for submission attempts from places where she was never going to get them. Uh, she was never... She had her legs crossed at the ankles above like Letourneau's neck. Like way the fuck up there. But... That, that was not a submission attempt. I don't know what the fuck she was doing way up there. Uh, mission control, holding her posture. She wasn't doing anything. I thought she was going to be able to hit a submission off of her back like she did against Joanne Calderwood. But Morose has not impressed me since that Calderwood fight and how she, she can be taken down easily. She has defended, I don't know if this is correct, but in Morose's career, it, she, it, UFC.com says she has 0% takedown defense. Fucking zero. She's facing a lady who is going to come out and wrestle her. Carla Esparza, throw a couple of looping shots, wrestle you. You have zero takedown defense? That doesn't look for Morose. Look, That does not look good for Morose. So for that reason alone, wrestler versus no takedown defense, no-brainer. Carla Esparza via decision. Devin Powell versus Darren the Saint Horcher. Powell is 8-1, and Horcher is 12 and 2. You guys might know Horcher for making his UFC debut uh, back in April of 2016 when he took a fight on super short notice, filling in for Tony Okukui Ferguson and fighting Habib the Eagle Nurmagomedov. Right. Yes. Um, in that fight against Habib, Horcher showed us that he has balls of steel a lot of Randy Cantu says I'm hating on Letourneau no I'm not hating on Letourneau I'm, I'm hating on Morose where she was on underneath Letourneau and just throwing out the dumbest guard you, you've ever seen like and she does that shit frequently she'll just go she'll put herself in stupid predicaments look for a low percentage submission and then spend the whole round there that's not good for morose and again where she's facing somebody who has a she carla esparza is of singular focus Whoop, gonna take you down gonna hold you there gonna baby ground and pound you i don't think that looks good for morose anyway back to powell horcher so horcher came in and he fought Habib Nurmagomedov on super short notice. That right there shows that he has a lot of confidence and the guy is brave as all get out. That's going to come into play in a second. He's also He also hits like a truck. He, he throws super fast hands. Um, he looked really good on the regional scene from the film I saw of him. His left hand is super quick and he steps up. He's a southpaw. He sets up his uh, left hand with a lot of dynamism with his right lead hand. His defensive grappling is solid, as we saw. He ended the first round against Habib with Habib on his back, and he finished the round there. He made it to the second round with Habib on his back. That's big. Um, he also, he's also decently dynamic. He's got some decent takedowns, some decent ground and pound as well. Uh, on the other side, Devin Powell, 
This guy, he's super long. Uh, he's really, really thin. Even for the lightweight division, he's, he, he's super thin, man. And he doesn't seem very strong. I talked about it last week on the rearview mirror about Inoue. Forget the guy's first name. The first fight of the night, I believe it was, a submission grappler. He got a lot of solid uh, positions on Carl's de Thomas, but he's not strong enough to finish his not strong enough to finish his submissions. Devin Powell is a similar guy. He's pretty. He's very dynamic with his stand-up striking. Throws a lot of lengthy kicks, front kicks, side kicks, roundhouse kicks, all kinds of kicks. But he's not strong enough, and he's not powerful enough to knock anybody out really with it in the UFC. And with his boxing, he he doesn't hit hard enough to make people respect his punches and stop them from keeping uh, moving forward. Powell needs a lot of distance, needs a lot of space to get off them dynamic kicks, but he doesn't have the punching power to keep people at range or to make them respect his punching power so they won't just come charging in. Horcher's going to come charging in. He's going to throw overhand lefts, and he's going to throw left straights after he comes charging in. I don't believe that Powell is strong enough or uh, hits hard enough does, doesn't have good enough footwork to keep Horcher off of him. I think Horcher's going to use that confidence, be brave, and just charge right through those straight punches and the long kicks of Devin Powell to get in close and land an overhand left or a left cross, which is Horcher's favorite strike, he says. And I'm picking Horcher probably via, probably via second round uh, KO or TKO. Let me translate this. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, we're going to talk about a fight that's not officially on UFC.com's website yet. And that is Vitor Miranda versus... V Vitor Lex Luthor Miranda versus Marvin Vittori. One sec. Sorry, guys. Portuguese. What does this guy say? I want to see the fights and no comments. That's what the Brazilian guy said. Rafael da Silva. I don't... I mean, I don't have the fights, bro. No comments. All right. Um, anyway, Marvin Vittori versus Vito Miranda. I just found out this fight was happening, like, when I got off work today. Like, I don't know. I saw that James Lynch had done an interview with uh, Marvin Vittori, but it's not on Wikipedia, and it's not on UFC.com. It's on SureDog, but I think it's on Tapped Out or Tapology. But it's not on UFC.com, so I didn't study it yesterday. So I did some quick study here today. And Miranda's, Miranda sat out for a super long time as well. Let me look how long he's been gone. Uh, he, oh, he doesn't have a Wikipedia page. God damn it. Anyway, Miranda against Chris Camozzi. Camozzi wrestled him. And a lot of people have wrestled Vito Miranda. He's a very dynamic kickboxer. His kicks are very very devastating his last fight was in may of 2016 so the theme continues of people that have sat out for a long time his opponent marvin vittori is gonna push forward take away that space from miranda so he can't get off those lengthy kicks vittori is gonna look for takedowns most of vittori's uh, victories are via submission he had an inverted triangle choke not too long ago i retweeted it earlier very impressive stuff um he beat albert Uda with a, a guillotine choke in the first round, who Uda is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. I really think that we, we basically have striker versus grappler here, and I'm going with the grappler. Vittori's going to take down Miranda and look for a submission. But Vitor, he didn't show me great fight IQ against Kamozi either, because he had a takedown once on Kamozi, and Kamozi quickly reversed it with his jiu-jitsu. So I'm picking the younger guy and the guy who has the more clear path to victory. I mean, Vitor has a puncher's chance, but it's like a kicker's chance, and Vittori has the better grappling. I'm going to side with the grappler here. Justin Darling asks, how do I choose a like vote? I'm on PC and usually use Facebook on my Android. Hmm, good question. Good question. I don't want to deviate too much from the show. Guys, all 30 of you, thank you so much for hanging out. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, you can just choose one of them, right? Yeah, just hover over or click and hold on like. Or just hover over like and then go up and it'll give you the options, uh, Justin. Okay, anyway, so I'm picking Vittori via, uh, let's go third round submission. 
Moving on down. Jared Flash Gordon versus Michelle. Not Michelle. Mitchell Quinones. Uh, again, we have a striker versus grappler. Quinones did an interview with James Lynch. It was pretty damn phenomenal. The guy is really athletic, and he's got a lot of fast twitch muscles. If you watch uh, Quinones fights, he will. He acts a little bit too severely to somebody fainting at him. But he's he's young in his fight career. He's eight and one. Flash Gordon is twelve and one. But I mean, maybe that's good to see. I don't I don't know exactly. But he will just like oh he you can see he reacts severely to somebody fainting at him. But with that fast twitch muscles, his kicks come extremely fast. Uh, his his hands are super super fast. He's got good foot footwork and movement. Uh, Gordon is going to throw looping punches to get in on some takedowns. I don't know if we've seen Quinones uh, have to struggle with being grappled. But again, we got a striker versus grappler here. And uh, I think this is going to be a night for the grapplers like Esparza, uh, Vittori, and Flash Gordon. I think uh, Gordon is going to be able to take Quinones down and maybe control him uh, via decision. But I will not be surprised whatsoever if Quinones uses those fast switch muscles to get a knockout. Not much film on either guy here. Moving down, Joshua the Sandman Stansbury versus Jeremy Grizzly Kimball. These guys are honestly kind of similar in that they, they're they rudimentary everywhere, kind of. Kimball, he's got this dad bod and he doesn't have great conditioning, but I think that part of Kimball's why he doesn't have great conditioning is because he throws a shit ton of wild techniques. He'll throw jumping knees, flying knees, spinning back fists, Superman punches all the fudge and time just over and over again. Superman punch, spinning back fist, jumping knee. And he doesn't look like a guy that should be able to do that, so that's surprising right there. He does have some decent takedowns. He's opportunistic with them. A guy will overextend and he'll just get it on their hips and you know shoot for an easy takedown. Stansbury, I think based on the interview with James Lynch, he's training with guys that he lost to or that he trained with during the Ultimate Fighter. He's training with uh, Khalil Round Roundtree, who knocked him out on the Ultimate Fighter. Now he's training with him. And he's also training with some of the other guys from the Ultimate Fighter. And I think he has a good camp around him. And if we're just talking about that like, Kimball is this flashy dude going to be throwing a lot of goofy shit, using his gas tank to uh, unintelligently... Stansbury is going to come out. He's going to be mentally focused. He's going to be kind of just like meat and potatoes on his game, moving forward a lot. Uh, he's actually kind of dynamic with his kicks. It's surprising a guy that, that, this is mean to me, but that looks the way he looks, can throw these kicks with a little bit of quickness. His hands are decently quick. Uh, I th I'm going to go with the guy who's going to be more focused and more plan-driven, more plan-oriented, and that's Josh Stansbury. I think he'll stay committed to his game plan more. He will use his gas tank more wisely than Kimball will. And I think that if he can survive the early goofy shit from Kimball, he should be able to get a knockout or a, or a TKO in round two or three. And I'm going to pick Stansbury via early third round knockout, maybe late second round knockout. But, yeah, I'm going to go with a more fundamentally sound man in the Sandman, Stansbury. First fight of the night. Tony the Eagle Martin versus Johnny Hollywood Case. There's some backstory to this fight, evidently. Again, Tony was talking on James Lynch's uh, YouTube channel, doing an interview with James, and he said that when he was 0-1, he was fighting on the same promotion as Johnny Case. Um, oh, and actually, let me go back to Stansbury versus Kimball. So Stansbury was the co-main event to... Uh, da, 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 da. Oh yeah, he Stansbury trains with Corey Hendricks. Um, oh yeah, Kimball. He owns a victory over Chidi and Jukawani, and he did so with basically with takedowns. So with that, with the solid timing, um, he can get those takedowns like he did on uh, Jeremy Kimball. He Kimball lacks discipline. I mentioned with his wild and crazy. Kimball lacks some focus with his wild and crazy striking, but he also lacks some discipline. He missed weight for a title fight at 185 pounds uh, back in prize fighting before he made his UFC debut, and it was 
uh, fight against Chris Camozzi. So he came in overweight for a title fight against Chris Camozzi, where Chris Camozzi just obliterated him. The fun fact I was trying to get to was Stansbury was the co-main event that night. So that's fun. So Stansbury has been aware of Kimball for a while. That fight happened in Colorado. Of course, I believe Camozzi is from there, so it was like his local promotion. Just a little fun fact. Um, these guys have known each other for a while. And again, I'm picking the more fundamentally sound man in Josh Stansbury. Tony Martin, Johnny Case. Tony, when he was uh, 1-0 as a pro, he was at a same, the same event as Johnny Case. And Johnny Case was cornering somebody that evening. And they were in the back. And Tony Martin saw Case from across the room or something. And was like, that guy looks like a douchebag. Case was acting like a douchebag, I guess. Uh, then Tony, as he got more and more experienced in mixed martial arts he started calling out johnny case and johnny case said nah man you don't have enough experience blah 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 then on snapchat tony said this johnny was talking shit about tony on snapchat saying tony was just a wrestler and that he was he was shit tony took issue with that so this evidently is a grudge match you haven't seen too much of it on twitter the beef happened because johnny blocked tony anyway for the stylistic matchup Johnny Case, even though he has a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, he says his favorite grappling technique is a punch or a kick that gets the fight to the floor. And Tony Martin obviously is going to be looking for the takedowns, looking for uh, chokes, looking for submissions once he gets the fight to the ground. He's really grinding and a really grueling type of fighter. He reminds me a lot of Chaz the Scrapper Skelly in that he stands kind of tall. He's real wooden and stiff looking like some yoga would really work out for him he needs to just get a little more loose his neck muscles are super tight which which makes me think that he's a little bit susceptible to being rocked and hurt anybody that has a lot of ten uh, tensity you know they're tense in the octagon i think that that makes them liable to get hurt to, from shots and johnny case is a really dynamic striker uh very long striking techniques even though he's at a reach disadvantage i think that to tony martin i think that he'll throw the lengthier striking techniques um i believe one sec. Um, yeah, Case is another guy who sat out for more than a year, and Tony Martin is coming off of a pretty impressive performance over Alex White. And Alex White is a 145-pound fighter, took the fight on short notice, came up to fight uh, Tony Martin. Again, we kind of have striker versus grappler here. Even though Case has a purple belt in jiu-jitsu, I question if he's going to be able to stop the takedowns of Tony Martin. Tony thinks that Case is going to be a little bit undersized because Case is a real string bean, kind of noodly looking dude. I've been back and forth on this. I think the odds, even though they're not out yet, the odds are probably going to be sitting somewhere around even odds, minus 110 to minus 110. Um, Martin, he could easily take down Case and, and win via decision. Um, Case has already fought someone similar to Tony Martin in his last fight against... Uh, the, the Australian up-and-comer, Jake Matthews. Um, and he got he was winning. He won the first two rounds against Jake Matthews and then got submitted in the third round. After eating a lot of body shots from Matthews, I really think that Case will be able to deal with the physicality of Tony Martin, and he'll probably be able to put a shin on Tony's tense neck. That's what I'm going with. I'm going with Hollywood Case via knockout. But I, but I question my own pick because Case... With this long layoff and with Tony Martin being really focused for this fight because he doesn't like Case, uh, with Tony's clear path to victory with the wrestling, Tony could easily get a decision. I reserve the right to change my pick by fight time, but as of right now, I'm going to go with Case via knockout. No confidence whatsoever, and I expect the line to be minus 100, minus 100. I'm not a... Not a I'm not a, a tout or a capper by any means, but that's where I expect it to be. That's just based on my own inability to confidently pick either fighter. So going through my picks, Kiesa, Hendricks, Herrig, uh, Reyes, Means, Seaver, Coke, Esparza, Horcher, Vittori, Quinones, Stansbury, and as of right now, going with Johnny Hollywood Case. For fight of the night, I'm going to predict that Kiesa versus Lee is fight of the night. For performance bonuses, I'm going to go with uh, Horcher for knocking out Powell early on in the fight. And to Timmy Means for probably dropping an overhand elbow on Garcia's face and finishing him um, toward the end of the second round. Stanley Honeycutt, before we leave, what do you think about Dana stripping Jermaine's belt for not defending her belt? 
when Connor has never once made a defense, a little favoritism here, don't you think? I know Connor has made the UFC, but anyway, so yeah, that brings us into section number two of the podcast. This is recent news. So the biggest piece of news coming out of the MMA world today is that Chris Cyborg Justino will fight Megan Anderson for the now vacant Women's Featherweight Championship of the World because Jermaine Duranamy has been stripped of the title. Stanley, I don't believe that there is favoritism being shown here. Jermaine refused to fight Cyborg. Cyborg is the clear number one woman's featherweight in the world, and she refused to fight her. She said, I will fight Holly Holm again, but if you want me to fight Cyborg, I've got a hand injury. And then she said she just won't fight her because she's a proven cheater. And then she said, fuck it, I'm not going to defend my 145-pound belt. I'm going back to 135. She said this stuff publicly. Then she said uh, that she can't take a fight right now because her day job is interfering with her taking a fight. That's why she said she couldn't fight at UFC 214. Is her fucking day job was holding her back. She's a cop in Denmark whatever that is I mean all of that shit strip that girl strip her get out of here and and also who is the clear number one woman's featherweight in the world cyborg and she refused to fight her at all she said I will not fight her uh okay and you don't want to defend your belt at all you want to go back to 135 and you can't even fight at 135 for a while because you got a day job no Take the belt from her, man. So, and also, this is the fight I want to see. Megan Anderson versus Cyborg. Uh, James Colburn says she never defended it. Uh, he's proved that she hasn't. Tommy Anderson says that class was meant for Cyborg literally 145. Yeah, dude. So... Yeah, take the belt from GDR. I don't care to watch her fight again. I didn't like her antics in the Holly Holm fight. I'm not a fan. Quickly, let me talk for a second about my position. I'm supposed to be an MMA journalist. I need to be unbiased, right? Well, one, this is mostly a hobby for me. Uh, Two, I'm a fight fan, number one. Every MMA journalist is a fight fan, number one. Why else would they want to cover a sport where you got to stay up almost all night long every single Saturday or, or wake up at 2 in the morning to watch a fight card that happens in Singapore that has you know no real substance to it? This is fun. I, I love mixed martial arts. I'm a fan. Uh, so I, I want to voice my opinions now again, now and again. And I'm not a fan of GDR. I didn't like her hitting Holly Holm after the bell like three times. I didn't like that she said... I can fight Holly Holm right now, but if it's Cyborg, I got a hand injury. I didn't like that she said she's not going to defend the belt, that she goes to 135. So I'm happy that she doesn't have the belt, and now we're going to get to see the real best woman at 145 pounds fight for that belt, and that is Cyborg. Whether you, whether you think that she's a cheater, she used steroids, and whether you, what, whatever your opinions are about Cyborg, sure, she got caught with... with uh, too high a testosterone or, or popped hot for PEDs before USADA and stuff. That's one thing. But, but it's undeniable that she is the best woman fighter in the world. At least at 145 pounds. It would be so fun to watch her versus Amanda Nunes. But it's undeniable Cyborg is the best woman fighter in the world. So, I'm glad she gets to fight for the title. Don't care who it is against. Could be Kat Zingano could be Megan Anderson. could be anybody. I'm glad that she gets to fight for the belt. Uh, who said it? Um, John Magdarog. I'm sorry I butchered your name, my friend. Steroids can't help you with skills. Right on, my friend. Uh, yeah, Tommy Arnold says the 145-pound division was made for Cyborg. Literally, yes. I'm glad the person we made the division for is fighting for the belt. I'm happy about it. Uh, next piece of MMA news we need to talk about is really boxing news, and that is that Conor McGregor is going to fight Floyd Money Mayweather on August the 26th of 2016. The fight is actually happening. Holy shit. While I think we can all agree, unless you're a huge Conor McGregor fan, I think we can all agree 
that Floyd's going to dominate Conor McGregor. It's not going to be a close fight, and yet we're all going to tune in because this is pure spectacle. As a lot of people are saying, this is pure money fight. Am I happy it's happening? A little bit, no. A little bit, no, but it's mostly mostly because I'm selfish. I prefer mixed martial arts over boxing. I think boxing is just limited. It's just you know one aspect of mixed martial arts. If you love boxing over MMA, that's fine. We can still be friends and have our differences. Connor going there to fight Floyd is going... Like, I feel no matter... It's, it might dwindle people's opinions on mixed martial arts ever so slightly. If there's a casual fan that isn't isn't that educated on how fighting works or how rule sets determine winners in in all sports, then their opinion of mixed martial arts, because Connor's the representative from mixed martial arts to go fight boxing, their opinion on MMA might be dwindled a little bit. And while that person maybe would never have watched mixed martial arts, I feel like that we risk... Uh, losing a little bit of credibility in mixed martial arts. Then, on the flip side, I'm arguing with myself, is that Connor could bring a lot of eyes to mixed martial arts that have, that never would have thought about watching it. Connor could have a decent performance, and they're like, gosh darn it, that MMA fellow really put on a good showing against Floyd Mayweather. You know what? I'm going to watch his next pay-per-view. Then it snowballs. Then they put the co-main event as Yoel Romero, or no, let's say a Bobby Knuckles, Robert Whitaker versus Michael Bisping. They put that as the co-main event to uh, Conor McGregor's next fight. And then Bobby Knuckles destroys Michael Bisping. And people are like, holy shit, there is more than one person in mixed martial arts that I want to watch. And that new person is Bobby Knuckles. And then so on and so forth. And now we got a shit ton more mixed martial arts fans. And you're thinking, what good does that do me, bro? Well, let me tell you. More eyes to our sport brings more money into our sport, which means we could have people that, more people training mixed martial arts full time. Rather than, I think, Dar- Darren or Daryl Horcher is still uh, a shift manager at a steel factory or some shit. What? Yeah. These people have day jobs. So if we could get more money into the sport, perhaps. And this is pure speculation. So there is no truth to anything that I'm saying. It's speculation. It's opinion. It's it's a perhaps type of thing. Anyway, more money in the sport, more people training full time, and then the end result is a higher level of competition. Then maybe we start pulling some. We're never going to get the 265 pound athletes because they're playing football and basketball and everything. But maybe we start pulling some bigger athletes for the 185-pound divisions, for the 170-pound divisions, and then in turn, our sport gets more exciting, uh, more fun to watch, um, and all that jazz. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, John Magdarog uh, says Mayweather versus McGregor is a money grab. Absolutely it is, 100% money grab. <clears throat> Justin Darling says the fact is boxing needs views and WME needs money. Someone is paying off the UFC's debts and UFC is providing boxing some serious numbers. I got to disagree, Justin. I think this is just a simple fact that Conor McGregor has been talking shit to Floyd Mayweather for a long time. Conor McGregor is the most popular person in mixed martial arts. And I went to eat at a restaurant once and I was wearing my Flying Brian t-shirt. Dude asked me what my t-shirt was and... You know, what it was for, I told him. And he said, oh, is that the thing that Conor McGregor does? Didn't know what mixed martial arts was. New fucking Conor McGregor. So, sure, it is a money grab through and through. Absolutely. But it's not that either side needs views or needs money. It's like, why not do it? If someone offered you $200,000 to moon somebody... I'm just throwing shit in the other. If somebody offered you $200,000 to moon somebody... Uh, to moon the Vegas Strip, that is a huge opportunity... And they're like, you have to do it now or the iron will not be hot anymore. You're like, damn it, I'm going to moon him. I'm going to moon him. That's kind of like M- McGregor versus Mayweather. It's the perfect time. The- McGregor has been leveling up and leveling up and leveling up. He gets the interim featherweight championship. Then he knocks out the champion, Jose Aldo, in 13 seconds. Now he's the uh, featherweight champion. Then he becomes the first ever simultaneous two-division champion with one of the most impressive performances of all gosh dang time. Where does he go from there? He fights uh, Habib and has the most difficult mixed martial arts fight he's ever had in his career. Or Tony Ferguson, same situation. Where does he go? He cannot go up from uh, being the two-division champ simultaneously. The only place is to fight Floyd Money Mayweather. And that's where we are, folks. So it's a simple... It's simple. 
it's really simple. Stanley Honeycutt says Floyd is a headhunter and good at blocking and dodging punches. He's going to embarrass Connor. Connor is going to have a win-win fight. If he loses, he wins a lot of money. If he wins, he makes a lot of money, and he beat uh, Floyd Mayweather. Okay, do you think Dana will let anyone else go to the boxing world? Um, Adrian Broner called out Nate Diaz for the co-main event of this fight card. I don't know if it'll happen, but so let's say you're on the fence about buying this card right now. Uh, Patrick Canez was saying, save your money for GGG versus Canelo. Uh, how about if Diaz versus Broner as the co-main event? Again, you're probably going to get Broner schooling him, but I don't even know what weight class Broner is in. That shows my um, boxing ignorance, so I apologize. But, I mean, right now I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Beyond this fight card, though, my opinion is that no, we won't see someone go to boxing again unless you know, they're out of their UFC contract and they go to boxing. But this one special night, perhaps we see a lot of circus shit. We see Nate Diaz versus Adrian Broner. Aldo De Leon says, what's my opinion on Stipe calling out Anthony Joshua? Did you see that Anthony Jones Joshua says, who the fuck is that guy? So, <laughs> whoops. Um, yeah, Stipe would get tooled on. But again, McGregor's going to get tooled on. So, Tommy Arnold says he would pay for it if Nate was on the card as well. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But but can they afford to pay Nate Diaz the money he would want for that? I don't know. Anyway, um, so I'm going to move into the next section of the podcast, guys. And it's probably not going to be a section where you really enjoy being here. But uh, we're going to do it anyway. The next section is called Geeked outside of mixed martial arts it's where i just take a few minutes uh get to you guys get to know me as a person uh, maybe i get to know you you can tell me what you've been geeking out about in the past seven days so a few weeks back i said i was geeking out about bonsai trees and gosh darn it i'm still geeking out about bonsai trees um my girlfriend brought me some apple tree seeds that i'm gonna grow some bonsai trees from seeds so we'll have a seedling and then i'll wire them together make some cool shit happen and then uh, I just bought some new bonsai pots, and I'm just learning so much about them every single day, learning about tree types. The reason I got into learning about trees and the reason I got into bonsai trees is I have severe anxiety. I, I get like an anxiety attack maybe once every other day, and it's horrible. And I know it's an anxiety attack. I'm like, I'm having an anxiety attack, but every time my brain's like, you're having a fucking heart attack, Brian. This is, this is the end for you. And then I start freaking out. What calms me down is looking at pictures of nature or going outside and looking at trees. So I decided to get a bonsai tree that I can have in my house. So, you know, you get a tree and it's in your house. Um, so I think it's a lot of fun. You know, they, they clean the air. They give you oxygen. It's something to focus on rather than ha having my fake heart attack. That's a lot of fun stuff. James Colburn says he loves bonsai trees. And Justin Darling says, bruh, he's been looking for a desk plant for a while. What do I recommend? I recommend uh, looking looking into some bonsai trees. Um, I got my first bonsai tree from Walmart. I had been looking at tr bonsai trees online for a while. And what stuck out in my mind what a bonsai tree was, was what Mr. Miyagi has on uh, the Karate Kid. Right? That was what I thought a bonsai tree was. No, a bonsai tree could be any type of tree that you just purposefully dwarf. You put it in a small container, uh, you trim the roots every once in a while, you keep it small, and you, you wire it so it bends a little bit and looks all cool. So I learned that any, tr any type of tree could be a bonsai tree. Um, what I would recommend, <laughs> Scott Poppleton says, Flying Brian J's new nickname is Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> Maybe. So what I would recommend, Justin, is uh, I bought my first bonsai tree at Walmart. Go check out... Earl May or Walmart or something and just look for a bonsai tree and find one that you like and, and take that baby home. And then you got to take nice care of it. My first one was a Fukian tea. It uh, blossoms, little white blossoms when it's happy. And um, so I try to spritz it with water every day and water it uh, in its pot every day so that I can get those blossoms to come out. And I think it's just a lot of fun. It's soothing. It's relaxing. And gosh darn it, it keeps the oxygen clean in my apartment and I love it. So Yep, that's pretty much it. The other thing I've been geeking out about is um, I've been trying to upgrade my computer so that when Destiny 2 comes out, I can stream on my 
personal YouTube channel or my personal Facebook channel, maybe Twitch, I don't know, uh, so I can stream the game, have a lot of fun there, and then also talk about mixed martial arts while I'm playing the game. So I've been buying some parts. I built my own computer uh, about two years ago, and I bought some parts to upgrade it to make it a little better, and I'm working on that. I'm geeking out about learning it. Um, It's a lot of fun. So anyway, I think that brings us to the end of the show. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe to MMA Mania on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Podcast Attic, wherever you like to get your podcasts. Please check that out there. And for the listeners of the podcast, I should have said this earlier, the final vote on Facebook was Michael Chiesa, 46, to Kevin Lee, 19, with uh, the majority of my Facebook viewers think that Chiesa is going to beat Kevin, the Motown phenom Lee. Follow me on Twitter at FlyingBrianJ. Please like my Facebook page. Um, it is facebook.com forward slash show, or you can go to facebook.flyingbrianj.com. would really appreciate it if you'd like my page. I'm almost to 500, and when I get there, I'm just going to do a little dance and then get down tonight. Bam, 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 bam. Anyway, I'll, I will be back on this Facebook page on Sunday before the fight card doing the MMA preamble where I will go over my level of excitement for the card, go over picks once again, uh, talk to you guys a little bit more about the card, tell you if ev- tell you if anything, in my opinion, has changed on the fight card. Maybe I can tell you guys if I still believe Tony Martin is going to beat Johnny Hollywood Case and whatever. So I will see you guys on Sunday. Namaste.